find your seats. Let's sing that song, Mighty is Our God. And mighty is our God. Mighty is our King. Mighty is our Lord, creator of everything. Mighty is our God. Mighty is our King. Mighty is our Lord, creator. His name is high. His name is higher, higher than any other name. His power is greater. He created everything. Mighty is our God. Mighty is our God. Mighty is our King. Mighty is our Lord, creator of everything. Amen. Thank you for coming out to Sunday School this morning. We're going to continue our series with Pastor Greg on Memorial Stones. There's Sunday School for all ages. Also, Spanish-speaking Sunday School is going to be here with us, translated, and we'll open in prayer. Father, we thank you for all that you're going to do this day. We give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, and thank you all for being here. We're going to continue on with our series entitled Memorial Stones. We've been looking at the history of our church and the history of the fellowship. We're learning lessons along the way because this is a biblical principle. When you line up with the past, you make sure you're still on the same track, and so that's what we are going to do. Let's read our main verse, Joshua 4, 4 through 7. Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, Cross over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan. And each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. That this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, saying, What do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord when it crossed over the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial to the children of Israel forever. Okay, so this is Lesson 12. I want to talk about troubles along the way. In, uh, in this kind of setting, I, I am not going to just simply be talking about all of the good things because anybody's history also has negatives. So we're going to deal with some negatives uh, today, and that's troubles along the way. There's a, a lesson that we're going to learn, and that is the attacks on the Prescott Church. There's a Bible principle, and that is the devil attacks what he fears. If the devil's never bothering you, it might be because you're already on his side. And so, but when you begin to do God's work, the devil fears that, and that's a Bible principle, then he goes on the attack. This is found in 2 Samuel 5, 17. Now when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines went up to search for David. And David heard of it and went down to the stronghold. Okay, so we're going to look at a number of attacks that uh, began to uh, happen. These are uh, probably starting around 1975, I would say. But the first was a physical attack. One night, I'm a, I'm a small boy. If it's 75, I'd have been 11 years old, 10 years old in that range. If it was 74, I don't remember. I was walking with Dad, and it must have been a concert night. And so we are walking near the church, and all of a sudden, my dad grabbed me and pulled me to the ground and I had no idea what was happening is someone had shot at my dad with with an arrow and it flew right past his head I had no idea like what's going cool? you get down and so uh, dad of course he he uh, he kept that quiet and didn't make much fuss about it but it, it began to be the devil was afraid the second thing that happened was arson one uh, night, Dad preached a uh, blistering sermon on sin and apparently dealt with uh, the sin of homosexuality. And on a Sunday night, uh, he got a call from the fire department and they told him the church is on fire. Someone had 
hid in the church, uh, stayed in, hid in a room somewhere. That would be very difficult to do with all of our cameras now, but nonetheless, they did this, and then in the church office, they lit a fire. We actually have the, some photos from the courier. These are not, you can't really see. It just shows some of the burn uh, damage there. And then the next photo uh, just says the church fire cause was said to be suspicious. Some of you that were here, this happened on a Sunday night and we had to work around the clock. People helped cleaning, helped painting, and we never missed a service by Wednesday. We were uh, able to uh, continue on. And so now there starts to be, these are two items of trouble. Then something very, very significant in the Prescott Church, uh, probably around that time, 1975 or so, we had our first rebellion in church. So in the Prescott Church, the foundation primarily was hippies, young people, sinners got saved, and by and large, they were incredibly grateful. We did have numbers of uh, church people. They were uh, excited to join with the church and to see the life and the young people, and as often as the case is uh, sometimes people come from other churches, and their first reaction is, we love the church. As a matter of fact, one of these, and maybe even two, wound up uh, being on the church council. But what happened is a man on the church council, he began leading a rebellion of people in the church. This is a biblical principle we find in Acts chapter 20. We, look, we see some of the, the marks of rebellion. Acts 20, verse 30. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Okay, so here is uh, some marks of rebellion. I've now been pastoring for over 37 years. That's an ancient scripture. It's universal. Mark number one is you always have someone pride who knows better than the pastor. This man began to speak. Pastor Mitchell is doing this wrong. You remember uh, when I told you about Harold Warner's accident in 1973. This is where it began, especially that Pastor Mitchell must be doing something wrong. My father refused to back down and, and we began to plant churches. But now this man, various things, Pastor Mitchell is doing it wrong. He's not good, but it's, it's, it's based on, on pride. He is saying Pastor Mitchell is not pastoring correctly. I've, I've always loved this as a pastor through the years when I have people who have never pastored and they're telling me how I'm doing it wrong. That's brilliant. That's like me telling a brain surgeon, you know, I think you're not doing that very good. It's like, and what is my experience in brain surgery? Zero. But nonetheless, it's pride. The second mark is always based on an offense is a rebellious person will always find something to be offended about. Well, you know, this can be a million different things, but something offends me, so therefore I'm unhappy. In our verse, because of pride and offense, in the verse that we just read, the Bible says that rebellious people speak perverse things. The word perverse is not talking sexually. The word just simply means twisted. And so now the point of this is to twist people and turn them away from their pastor, from their church. They, a rebel always sows suspicion. Why do you think pastor did that? You, you're happy now all of a sudden like, yeah. Suspicion, and the point is to turn them away. I don't think that he should have done this or that. But the verse that we read, the mark of a rebellion, rebellion is always about power. And our scripture that we read says to draw away disciples. And this is uh, uh, what the person wants. It's always about power. Sometimes in extreme cases, you have people that want to start their own church. 
And so they want to draw people away to start their own church. We'll look in many later lessons. It'll be quite some time now, but this happens in a fellowship that we had that the same, to draw away so that I have power over people. But often they don't want to start their own church. They just enjoy having the power of people who agree with them against the pastor. And so uh, this uh, uh, was what uh, this man was doing, leading a group of people. The next mark of rebellion is this. Rebellion, as I said, always has an offense. A rebel doesn't want to resolve it. You can sit down with someone who is rebellious. What's the problem? I'm offended. You didn't shake my hand. Your breath is bad. I, you know, whatever their problem is. So how do we fix this? A rebel doesn't want to fix it. That's not the point. I'm not offended, so to get an apology, to fix it, to, you know, they don't want to fix it. They are simply using an offense to draw people away. And so this man did not want to fix it. Uh, they, usually the, the, the goal is either get the pastor removed, and when they come from a church setting, I explained in our, in our fellowship, our church council in Prescott does not run the church. And so if, if uh, people come in, they've come from a church that the church hires and fires. So that is what happens is I want to get enough people upset and on my side so we can fire the pastor and get a new pastor. We don't operate that way, so that would be a, a, a mistaken idea. At the same time that you had someone on the council doing this, I told you in the early days we had a number of uh, evangelists, and they, of course, were all not from our church. They were from outside. Excellent evangelists, uh, John Metzler, very, very helpful. Had another man that was very, very helpful, but unbeknownst to my father, this man, when he would come and preach a meeting, he was meeting people and then meeting with them privately, and he started showing them in the Old Testament, who did you give your tithe to, to the priest? So if you're giving it to a church, that's wrong. That was his reasoning. So he started getting people in the Prescott Church, send your tithe to me. Very helpful soul he was. <laughs> And so you, you had this as a result of this council member, strong personality, pulling on people, and then this evangelist pulling on people, obviously for his own financial gain. So the result was we had our very first rebellion. A number of people left the church, and always when people choose to leave the church, they don't just leave. It's not just them. They start talking and trying to pull uh, other people away. This blind side of my father, and absolutely it affected him very much because he was so excited at the good things God was doing. Sinners are getting saved. Disciples are being raised up. We are planting workers with this great vision that God had revealed, not by going to Bible school, but through discipleship. Churches were growing they're getting converts. They're now making disciples to my father. This was the most wonderful thing in all the world. He was shocked. Like, why would you not love that? How could you not love sinners are getting saved? How could you not love that young couples are being raised up and, and the kingdom of God is being uh, extended? And he's began to describe to me that in later years, this uh, man that was on the council, the main rebel, when he would speak to him, he said his mind would be tormented because this is a Bible principle found in 1 Samuel 15, 23. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Okay, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Witchcraft is trying to manipulate another person's will. But it's supernatural. And having, through the years of ministry, I have 
uh, gone through uh, rebellions, been involved with people, had to counsel people in rebellion, something comes on their mind. It is supernatural. It is demonic. They don't think clearly. And so this is my father now. You have to imagine he doesn't, I, I described to you last week in the four square that we were part of, once you went to Bible school, you actually were disconnected from having a pastor. You had supervisors, but it was political. These were people who you didn't know. They didn't personally have investment in love. So my father is battling this without the benefit of what we have now. He couldn't just call his pastor and ask for help. It didn't operate in that way. So he is fighting this on his own and it tormented his mind. Years later, uh, I went through, and I was uh, pastoring in Australia, I went through a, a, a rebellion, uh, too long of a story, but uh, the same thing, a man on the council, I was uh, rising up, came in to speak to me and something came on my mind. I had never, no matter if I went through a hard time, I had never considered quitting. When that man spoke to me, he left my office, I actually called up my father to quit because it made perfect sense. I should not be in the ministry. And I am having a, what I think is a logical conversation, clear that I shouldn't be in the ministry, you should get somebody else. My dad started shouting at me. But what was interesting, he started shouting at me the name of the very first rebel in Prescott. And he said, don't you get it, Greg? It's witchcraft. You didn't feel that way before until that man spoke to you. And the reason why he was able to help me, he's able to pray, and that lifted off of my mind is because he had to fight that battle. So now you are having, have you ever noticed this? I've, I've often pointed out the devil does not operate like an old Chinese karate movie. Remember, remember the old Bruce Lee movies, any of you back in the day? Is those who want to attack you, they politely wait their turn. You're fighting one and the other guys, they're just kind of standing around like, you know. The devil definitely does not operate that way. He never comes, the Bible says, like a flood. This is often what happens. And so now you have physical attack, you have arson, you have rebellion. You have all of these things, uh, and so this is stirring all at the same time. Now, my father has this great vision from God about planting churches, which is an incredible privilege for a worker that we would invest in you. You are untried. You've never gone to Bible school. We'll put money behind you. You would think every worker that we send out would be incredibly grateful, but my dad now began to deal with the realities of church planting, and that is we sent workers, and some of them in their struggles, this is human nature, they began to say, it's my pastor's fault that I'm not having revival. They're upset with him. We brought back the very first worker that ever in our history, we had sent out now a number of works, and we had to bring back the first one and when he came back in the church, he is upset that he didn't succeed and he began to speak. So now it's the perfect storm. He had family, his wife had family in the church and they began to speak and began to uh, uh, attack. So my father, after all of these assaults coming, my dad, again, he doesn't have a pastor that he can just pick up the phone and, and get help for. He came to the conclusion, I think I've taken the church as far as it can go. I apparently shouldn't be here because of all these struggles. The struggles must be because of me. And so what he did, he said, I think someone more experienced should come and take over as pastor of the Prescott Church so it can release its full potential. So he contacted 
a man named Wes Baker, one of those, the original evangelists that we had come, knew him from Foursquare. We have a picture of Wes Baker. He came in the early days and preached. Contacted Wes Baker and offered, Wes, you have more experience than me. You come to Prescott and take the church. And they actually began to make arrangements to do this. Wes was at that time pastoring in the Los Angeles area, began to make arrangements for someone to take his church. He was going to come and take the church in Prescott. My father didn't have direction, but he saw he was, I told you my dad always had a heart for the nations. And I described to you how the work in Mexico came about is we sent a guy who couldn't even speak Spanish, but the gospel worked. Through interpreters, the gospel worked. And so my dad said, if it works for him, maybe I'll go to Mexico and start a work. And so this was, the steps were in place that Wes Baker was gonna come take the Prescott Church and my dad was going to leave. Some of you should be very afraid right now. (laughs) <laughs> Wes Baker called up my dad and said I've been praying and he said Wayman you're making a mistake I don't think you should go and he said I'm not going to take the church you need to stay there and work it out with God and because of that this forced my dad to lay hold of God He had to. There was no easy way out. It's the same advice my dad told me about marriage. You can't get out. You have to work it out. And so he did. He began to lay hold of God. He began to believe that God, if he called him here, God was going to equip him and God was going to help him. And I don't know if you understand this, the future of the fellowship was weighing in the balance at that point in time. I'm I'm sure Wes Baker was a good man. He had some good things, but he would not have done what my father did. But my point that I want to make in in, uh, Matthew 16, 18, I have a verse here that talks about the church. I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Okay. Jesus says, how does he look at every church? He says, it's mine. And he says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That, of course, is talking about us attacking hell, but it works the other way. My father has said over and over again through the years, he said, this is a work of God and not of man. And one of the things when you look back on history, you think, oh God, you stepped in because you have a plan for our church and for the fellowship. Thank God. Let's talk then about some milestone breakthroughs. So out of that, the the vision of church planting that we had begun around that time, there probably were uh, only about 10 churches or so. The vision of church planting was gradually revealed over time. I've made this statement before. My father said that I stumbled into the will of God. In other words, God didn't give him this grand blueprint every step along the way. He just began to feel this is what we should do, and we began planting churches. But this vision, it was gradually revealed in this way. My father understood Biblically, church planting is connected to what he called the indigenous principle. Indigenous means from within. From within. This is based in Genesis 1.11. Then God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth, and it was so. Okay. You understand the book of Genesis, this is not just a botany statement, right? This is not just about how plants work. The book of Genesis is the book of beginnings. There are principles there that apply to everything. The statement I want you to look at here, he says, whose seed 
is in itself. So that principle is first of all applied to discipleship, whose seed is in itself means it is not biblical to send converts away to be trained because the Bible says the seed is in itself. Every local church has the ability to train its workers. But now as we begin to plant workers first in uh, Arizona, then New Mexico, then California, one of the things that my father began to be convinced about was if that scripture is true, the indigenous principle, seed within itself, from within, that means not only can Prescott plant churches, but every church we plant, its seed is in itself, it can propagate itself, which means they should be able not only to get people saved, to disciple workers, but every church has the power to plant their own churches. That is what he believed, but it was a theory up until that point. We had milestone number one. We're going to talk about five milestones. Milestone number one, the first granddaughter church. Granted, we call a baby church. That's our daughter church. We had our first daughter church plant their church because the seed is in itself. And this happened uh, out of Flagstaff in October of 1976. Joe and Becky Weidinger were sent from the Flagstaff church into Winslow, Arizona. We have some pictures here of the church in Winslow. This, of course, is a modern uh, version of uh, Winslow. You're singing the song standing on the corner right now. Uh, the next uh, picture here is the first, uh, I believe this is the very first building they had. They called the church Victory Chapel. Uh, next picture here, we have a uh, float. They began to do exactly, Flagstaff did what they saw in their mother church. Floats in the parade, we do that to this day. Here's a band, this is a concert that they did. That's what they did in Prescott. And Pastor Ron Burrow in Flagstaff, he reproduced that in Flagstaff. And now the church in Winslow, they uh, continued to do that themselves. And so what happened is uh, the church grew to about 60 people and it happened quite quickly. Next picture, here's an outreach at a, at a football uh, stadium is they're having an outdoor service and outdoor uh, outreach. So I, I want you to understand how incredible this was. That theory that my dad had from the Bible, it worked. And so this showed something profound, this milestone, that church planting is not just a Prescott thing, right? There are people like, oh yeah, that's what God's doing in Prescott. He said, no, no, that's not a Prescott thing. This is uh, uh, the indigenous principle, and it works not just in Prescott that we can plant, but they can get people saved, make their own disciples, and send them out. And so Winslow, Arizona showed that this worked. We have another picture from Winslow. Jack and Jan Miller from, this is Bethany's parents, Pastor uh, uh, Bethany Morales, her parents, they were saved in Winslow, Arizona, and ultimately were sent from Winslow. And so this is the indigenous principle. Milestone number two was, okay, it worked in Prescott, and yeah, that worked in, in Flagstaff, but my father believed it'll work anywhere. And so uh, milestone number two was we had our second granddaughter church from a different congregation. In May of 1977, the church in Tucson, Pastor Harold Warner launched Kim and Josie Pensinger into Clifton Morency, Arizona. We have a picture here of uh, the metropolis of Clifton. I think, I don't remember if that's Clifton or Morency. They're kind of twin towns about the same size, but they sent a worker uh, there. And I think we have a next picture 
Here are the pen singers in an early uh, conference in Tucson. That's the couple in the uh, middle, white dress, and he has a light blue suit there. So in the same way, now they were able to be sent. It wasn't, Prescott didn't send them. This is second generation. And the same thing that worked when Prescott planted, the same thing that happened when Flagstaff planted, now Tucson began, that was the very first church that they ever sent out. Then we had milestones three and four, is, you know, sometimes in life, people, you, you have in music, you have one-hit wonders. You remember that? They, they have one hit, like, whatever happened to them? I don't know, they just did it one time and never were heard from again. We don't want church planting to be a one-hit wonder. And so we had two milestones, and that was second baby churches were planted out of churches that we uh, planted. This happened first of, of all. The second baby church planted out of Flagstaff happened in July 1977. Flagstaff planted Ron and Su uh, Judy Simpkins into Payson, Arizona. We have here, this would be a more modern picture. This is probably in the 80s uh, of, uh, uh, of Payson. And then we have a number of pictures here I want to show you out of Payson, Arizona. Here, that is the clientele that we are reaching. That is Dave and Debbie Suspansky, who now are leaders in our fellowship, pastoring in Jacksonville, North Carolina. Is uh, actually, if I remember right, it was Dave and Debbie Stevenson got saved first and uh, began to witness to the Suspanskys here, and they got saved. Next picture here. Now, here is that same Dave. What is our principle? You don't just get them saved. Now here is Dave leading an outreach down at the river. He is preaching. He began to be a disciple. Next picture. And here they said this float caused a stir when people saw a victory chapel is the church God goes to. And there were people very upset, but boy, did they talk about it. Now everybody knew some were outraged, some were intrigued. But what they're doing, that is a float. Where did they learn that? From their mother church. Where did their mother church learn that? From Prescott. Is you go to the people outside the four walls, the gospel is being uh, proclaimed. The next picture, out of that church here in later years, this is now that same couple you saw a few slides ago. Here's Dave and Debbie Suspansky, ultimately. Remember, from within whose seed is in itself. That means out of Payson, there Dave and Debbie Suspansky were sent out, and I believe that could be Glenn Cluck that is sending them out. Next picture, here is some men from Payson. Ron Simpkins is the man on the left. He's the one who originally pioneered it. Glenn Cluck, there's a young Glenn Cluck, Glenn and Donna, uh, uh, took this church, and if I remember right, this is the first church they ever pastored in our fellowship. And there on the right, that is Dave Stevenson, still pastoring. Dave and Debbie were ultimately sent out from Payson. Numbers of uh, uh, excellent couples wound up coming from them. And the final picture that we have here, there is Doc Wilson. Our own Doc Wilson, Doc and Patty, are products of the Payson congregation. Uh, as well. So this, this was a milestone. This was now the second church. It wasn't a one-hit wonder out of Flagstaff, but this could be reproduced. In October of 1977, the same year, Tucson planted their second church into Douglas, Arizona. And I think we have some pictures uh, here. There's the milestone. Here is, uh, that is uh, Larry and Susan Beauregard being prayed for by Pastor Harold Warner. In uh, Tucson, they are being launched out. The next uh, picture here, uh, here is the, the building there in Douglas, Arizona. He began building a work, and it worked in Douglas just like it worked in Tucson, just like it worked in Clifton. After about two months, they were running about 20 people. 
And so God began to build. We actually have a picture of the, uh, here's an early picture of the Douglas Church. And in the same way, the gospel that worked in Prescott, that worked in Tucson, now it is working in Douglas, Arizona. Douglas, Arizona, for those of you that are here that are, you're not from around here, if you're watching this, is Douglas is another, Arizona is a border state. That means Mexico is our southern border. We have a, a picture here. Douglas is a border town. And so what you see here, we have a number of cities on the border that you have an American city and just divided by a border fence, then you have a Mexican city. So directly across the border is the city of Agua Prieta in, um, uh, and I believe that's still Sonora in, in Mexico. Larry Beauregard said that, uh, first of all, Douglas was actually a predominantly Spanish-speaking town, and Larry did not speak Spanish. Susan did not speak Spanish, but God was able to help them. They're still building a work in a predominantly Spanish town because the gospel works and the gospel crosses uh, barriers. Larry said that he was fasting and praying. He was seeking God, and he said one morning in prayer, God spoke to him, start a Spanish service. And he was thinking, yeah, you know, when I get people and we'll work it out, but God dealt with them, do it now. So on Sunday, he announced to his congregation, starting next Thursday night, we are going to have a Spanish service to reach people who only speak Spanish. They all cheered, but the problem was he didn't have an interpreter, they didn't have any music for in Spanish or whatever. He had a, a relatively new convert that got saved. He began to ask him, could you interpret for me? And, and the guy said, okay. He was willing to try. He had a man coming that uh, was still apparently uh, singing in some of the bars. That was his, his job was singing in the bars, but he had gotten saved. And he said, could you do some Spanish music? And he said, yes, he could, uh, as long as his bar job didn't interfere. But... Uh, <laughs> Uh, and so he did it on the, the next Thursday in their very first service, 28 people illegally crossed the border into Douglas, Arizona to come to church and all 28 got saved. So the God began to do a miracle, yes. So now you have all of these people from Mexico they all get saved, and so he said, clearly, you know, they're not going to be able to cross the border every time. So he said, How, who here we, would let us do a Bible study at your house? And apparently they were so enthusiastic, they almost had a fist fight fighting for who could have it. So he wound up rotating. He said for the next two months, he wound up doing four Bible studies a week in Mexico. He would cross over each time, and they would move from house to house, and uh, they began uh, to do that. One Sunday evening, three ladies from Agua Prieta, now this is uh, Mexico, but they had crossed over, came to his English service, or, uh, or maybe this was the Spanish service, but no, on Sunday it had to be the English service. Uh, and they asked him if he would go to cross the border and pray for a young boy. Young boy had been diagnosed with water on the brain, and they said they've given him only one week to live. Please, pastor, would you come and pray for him? And he said he agreed. He actually was about to go out of town. So he said, okay, I will. Um, and he crossed over after the service, went with them, crossed the border, and went and laid hands on the boy uh, they were Catholics. The house was filled with idols. He said, you need to get rid of all this. And they agreed because they were desperate. Laid hands and prayed, but because the boy was sedated, he didn't know did anything happen or not. Went out of town for uh, a, a couple of days. Thursday night, after laying hands on the boy on Sunday, on Thursday night, all 28 of the people got saved. They were in church. 
but they brought another 30 people with them because the boy had gotten healed. And off of the back of that boy getting healed, the word began to spread and now another 30 people came and they all got saved. So God is doing something powerful here uh, in, and so now, Pastor, the same thing that happened in Nogales happened in Prieta. Our intention was let's have an English service, and now, coincident, that wasn't our plan, but how many of you know God gets a vote in everything? In this church planting thing, God gets involved. And so now you're having a tremendous response on the Mexican side. And so Pastor Larry Beauregard, he's running himself to exhaustion, trying to pastor effectively two churches at the same time. So now we come to milestone number five. Remember, let's go back to what we said about the indigenous principle from within. So if it is true that every living thing, the seed is in itself. So now as Pastor Mitchell began to apply it was first of all, we can train our own converts, we can disciple them, train them, send them out. Then the next step was, so if we send them out, they should be able to, but that, that of course was only in an American setting. But now my father began to believe what that actually means is, theoretically, that'll work anywhere. That's not just in America, and so now we have milestone number five, the first international church ever planted. So think about this. Larry was uh, exhausting himself trying to pastor two churches, so he said to Pastor Warner, either you need to send somebody to help me who speaks Spanish, or we need somebody who speaks Spanish, they need to take the church in Agua Prieta, Arizona. So Harold Warner spoke to the pastor of the church in Nogales, Mexico. I told you that story, how God, in a similar way, supernaturally, that work began to be built. And he said, do you have a worker that you have trained that could take the church in Agua Prieta? And he said, we will help with money. We'll do a joint venture. If you have the man will help with some finances. And so in February of 1978, Nogales, Sonora, Mexico, sent out their very first worker, Alfonso Jimenez, took the church in Agua Prieta, Sonora, Mexico. Here's just a, a picture here. Agua Prieta was a, a larger uh, town than, than Douglas. And uh, so, but this was now incredible this heavenly vision that my father got of discipleship and church planting, it now worked in another nation. You have to understand, there was no rule book. There's no, what's normal to you? You saw it on Thursday night. It's like, oh, that's wonderful, but of course we do that. This was unknown territory. But that's what my father believed. It will work if the Bible is true the indigenous principle, that means it will work in other nations as well. And that is exactly what happened. A Mexican church sent a Mexican disciple to pastor and he had never gone to Bible school. So now we see this vision is not just a Prescott thing. It worked in Prescott. Well, yeah, that's why. No, no, no. It's not just an American thing. It is a God thing. It's a heavenly vision. Therefore, that was the very first time that we saw this vision will work anywhere in the world. Uh, now, I'm, of course, I'm leaping ahead to today. We now have churches in 139 nations of the world because of what God said. Amen. Amen. In the indigenous principle, every time we send a worker out, 
This is what we believe whose seed is in itself. From our congregation, we're sending Manny and Patty now. They're going to go to Charlotte, North Carolina. Manny, we're not sending you to start a church. We're sending you to make disciples. And when you get there, you're going to get people saved. From day one, you're going to be thinking, I am here to make disciples so that one day you will plant churches in Charlotte, North Carolina, just like here. Amen. And I just say with, with, I have pastored in different nations of the world, wherever we see couples that come, if their vision is only, I want to build a church, they do not succeed because that's not why God has them there. The men who come and understand whose seed is in itself. I am here to get people saved, but that's only step one. Once I get them saved, we're building a church. Step two, we make disciples. We train them in-house from within. Step three, every local church has the ability ultimately to plant churches. And that works all across America. That works everywhere in the world. But this is where it first began to come from is it came and it started Flagstaff and Tucson and then we see in Mexico and once we saw that this opens up the whole world to us and I'll tell in later stories of how God began to move in Australia and the Philippines and Romania and different places around the world I will tell some of those stories but once we saw it worked in Mexico baby we're off because it will work everywhere and it still works today. We saw and uh, we had nine, uh, nine announcements in, on uh, Thursday night just a few days ago because that indigenous principle, it works everywhere, it still works today. And I believe in that vision. How many of you believe in that vision? Let's praise God together. Let's thank God for his goodness. Oh, God, I am so grateful, Lord God, that you allow us to be a part of your will. Praise God. We're going to stop there. We stop a little, uh, a little bit early and give you time to fellowship. And then at 1030, our morning service, Pastor Daryl Elliott is going to be preaching. God bless you.